you all so much for joining us for another Malaprops Bookstore and Cafe author event. This is a virtual event, and it's a singular pleasure and honor because I am going to be uh, speaking with historian, former journalist, uh, Fergus Bordovic. And Fergus was very important in a lot of uh, historians training and I'm one of them. And so I just can't tell you how uh, honored I am and how uh, important it is that people pay attention to Fergus's work and of course his contribution and his unfailing optimism that uh, that the study of history and the political uh, milieu is worth understanding and knowing about. Uh, so it's it's great it's great to be here with Fergus. Before we get started, uh, let me just tell you a few things, uh, just sort of uh, preliminaries. We always appreciate it when our audience makes a decision to support independent bookstores like Malaprops. Malaprops has been in business for almost 22 years, and that's because of a community. And then, of course, through the virtual world as well, communities that we were able to reach and to cultivate. And of course, we are always happy to support and highlight fiction and nonfiction authors and poets, writers, creatives. Uh, thank you for making a conscious choice to support independent bookstores. You can find out more about independent bookstores near you or when you're traveling at IndieBound.org. I'm joined behind the scenes tonight with the director of author events, Stephanie Jones Byrne. And Stephanie will be posting in the YouTube chat as Fergus and I are speaking this evening. We will be taking questions and you can post those questions. You've got a couple of ways to get those questions to us. And of course, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, the first way is to log into YouTube and then post your question in the chat itself. If you could please start it with a queue, that'd be great. That helps us out. The second way, if you don't want to log into YouTube, is to send it via email. We have a dedicated email address, and that's virtualqa at malaprops.com virtualqa at malaprops.com, and that will be in the YouTube chat as well. Uh, now, let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to uh, be in conversation with Fergus. I have a PhD in Native American history from the University of Oklahoma. My area of study is modern Native American history, and so Fergus's book, Killing the White Man's Indian, was uh, one of the books that I was assigned in graduate school to read to think about and reconsider modern Native American history and the history of indigenous peoples uh, really since uh, colonization, but in the modern era. And so my study of the Society of American Indians and their role in the uh, progressive era had, was influenced heavily by the Civil War, by the passage of the 14th Amendment, by debates over U.S. citizenship, and by the struggles at the national level and at the state level and really at the community level for rights. And those are voting rights included. And that's some, those are things that Fergus has dedicated his study to as well. So I feel so pleased to be able to talk to him about this book. And let me hold it up here. Clan War, Ulysses S. Grant and the Battle to Save Reconstruction. Fergus has written several nonfiction books, and I'd just like to read a few of those titles to you because they're wide ranging. And at the same time, they're books that I want to, I would say is like a Venn diagram and you could look at how they overlap. Congress at War, How Republican Reformers Fought the Civil War, Defied Lincoln, Ended Slavery and Remade America. The First Congress, How James Madison, George Washington, and a Group of Extraordinary Men Invented the Government, Bound for Canaan, 
the story of the Underground Railroad. And then another one of my personal favorites, it's about Fergus's mother, and it's entitled My Mother's Ghost, A Courageous Woman, A Son's Love, and the Power of Memory. Fergus, I want to thank you so much for being here with Malaprops this evening. Uh, I'm particularly thrilled when somebody likes Killing the White Man's Indian, which was published before digitization, so it doesn't exist in digital form. It's an actual, just out there as a book, as we used to know them. Right, it's true, and uh, you have uh, been slogging away in the independent scholarly world. You were a journalist, you drove a taxi, you, you've done all sorts of things, and I wanted to uh, start off because one of the things I told you before we got started was I really see Clan War as being a part of a trilogy of seminal works on Reconstruction. The other book, of course, is Eric Foner's uh, tome, Reconstruction, and then W.E.B. Du Bois' book on Reconstruction. I believe that was published in 1935, but there are fact checkers out there who can yep. correct me on that. But there are those three. And so I, first of all, wanted to make that a part of uh, framing our discussion this evening. But I was also hoping you might be willing at some point to talk a little bit about how you decided to write this book. It takes a long time to write books and do the research. And surely some of this was done during the pandemic. So how did you come to this particular subject? And uh, what was it like to do some of that work during the pandemic? Well, let me say a word or two about uh, both Du Bois and Foner, since you uh, you brought them up. I mean, I stand on their shoulders, both of them. W.E.B. Du Bois's book, Black Reconstruction, published in 1935, as you as you said, was the most honest book about Reconstruction uh, in nearly the span of nearly a century, uh, written when the so-called Dunning School, that's to say the actual revisionist school of historians, that's to say uh, lost cause, pro-Southern, dare I say, fundamentally racist histories dominated, uh, histories of Reconstruction dominated thinking about the period. W.E. Du Bois was a voice in the wilderness who was blunt in, in recording one, putting Black people at the center of Reconstruction as, as both agents of their own uh, development and, and uh, leading their own struggle for, for to uh, uh, make reality out of, out of the freedoms extended by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and then suppressed by white so-called redeemers, white supremacists. And uh, uh, Eric Foner's book, written in the 1970s, uh, is magisterial. It was the most important book after um, Du Bois's in addressing the realities of Reconstruction, which is to say, uh, uh, by throwing out the rubbish of, of the lost cause narrative, the white supremacist narrative, which, which was fundamentally degrading to African-Americans and denied the truth, the many truths of Reconstruction as a, as Foner himself has said, the second founding of the United States or a, a bold and politically very brave attempt to uh, uh, complete the, the, um, a, the, the development of the United States based on a full recognition of, of civil rights and, and, and more than that. Uh, so, I mean, the, as I said, I feel that I stand on the shoulders of both both these historians. And I, 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 before I depart from that, I want to say that a one of a very kind reviewer of my book, who liked the book a lot, described it as a revisionist history, and it, that was meant very well. However, the real revisionists were the lost cause advocates, the defenders, the pro-Southern defenders of white supremacy who revised 
the brutal truths and the 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 muscular idealism of reconstruction and the empowerment and self-empowerment of African Americans during the reconstruction period. Uh, uh, the revisionists were those who denied all that. And, and today, I think we're finally in an era when we are again telling truths about reconstruction as a uh as as a brutal reactionary repression of some of the country's uh best impulses and aspirations um but i'm still grateful for the nice review even if i was called a revisionist it's okay uh <laughs> so so uh, to, to answer the second part of your question how did the book come to be and and in uh, uh, several different streams flow together here um uh, one is the simplest to explain is that this book folded out of my previous book, which was Congress at War, and it, that focused on the Republican radicals uh, uh, of the Civil War era who had far more influence in the way the war was fought than they're generally credited with doing. People like Thaddeus Stevens, Ben Wade, Charles Sumner, and, and others whose names are less familiar, perhaps. Uh, but who were still there and were the were initially at least the the cutting edge of reconstruction. They they were the individuals who uh, were most determined to really rebuild the South uh, on on more or less egalitarian principles, incorporating African Americans fully into political, uh, 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 public, and ultimately even social life. Um, and I wanted to see those people at work in Reconstruction after after the war. Uh, I mean, they politically were heroic, uh, and I, I think they deserve to be seen that way. Uh, on another plane, uh, much earlier in life, much earlier in life, I, I did voter registration in in the uh, segregated South, and had a couple of personal con confrontations uh, with the Klan. That's the third Klan of the 1960s. Uh, my book is about the first Klan, the original Klan, the 1870s. Uh, but I, I uh, to some degree, a modest degree, I had to uh, move, I witnessed the Klan of the 1960s up close. And uh, uh, the book is dedicated to uh, the man I worked most closely with, uh, who's been gone many years now, but who was a, a, an extremely bold and brave uh, African American activist who who faced down the Klan personally again and again in the area where I worked. And uh, may I may I mention that name because I have it marked in the book, and it says here, uh, in memory of my friend Nathaniel Lee Hawthorne, the bravest man I ever knew who faced down the Ku Klux Klan in Lunenburg County, Virginia. And I had it marked to ask you, who was Nathaniel Lee Hawthorne and why did you dedicate the book to him? Yeah, uh, Lunenburg County at the time, by the way, was sometimes referred to as Virginia's Alabama. Uh, uh, I, I won't digress into describing Lunenburg County particularly, except to say that it was pretty remote then. Uh, it's pretty, the largest town in the county was 3,000 people. And uh, it was uh, a, a uh, battlefield for the Klan uh, coming up mostly from North Carolina, as a matter of fact, at that time, at that juncture. And there was a real struggle underway to register African-American voters. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, was a World War II veteran who was almost killed uh, during the Italian campaign he was really held together with piano wire, but he was a, an absolutely indefatigable, courageous man who uh, was afraid of nothing. And um, again, I, I could spend the whole hour talking about Nathaniel Lee Hawthorne, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, uh, you know, he, he is a heroic heir to the history that I write about in Clan War. Uh, there's a third element to what, what, led to the writing of this book. And frankly, though th this, this is a book of history. It's not a political polemic. It's not about today's politics. Although I think it's hard to read 
the history of Reconstruction and the Klan War without drawing some uneasy conclusions about latent possibilities uh, for for reaction, reactionary politics, and even terrorism that lie in today's American society. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate that uh, terrorism has an American history. We think tend to think of terrorism as something uh, terrorist organizations as having strange names and existing in faraway countries, Al Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, whatever. Uh, uh, but the Klan is pure homegrown terrorism. It, it, it was a movement as organized, determined, and and frankly barbaric in in the eighteen. 60s and 70s as any terrorist movement you read about in the papers today. Much of that truth has been suppressed because it is ugly. It is something Americans, I think, we like to be rather positive about our history, broadly, generally speaking. And this is this the, the, the bravery in, in, in this story of mine is really about those who stood up to terrorism, uh, a terrorism that was equivalent to that the kind that we know from the present day. And I, I think anyone who knows 20th century history generally at all well knows that the line between civilization and barbarism can be mighty thin. Yes, uh, very and, true. Yeah. So it all flows together in this book. Well, I really loved your preface because not every preface makes a point to, first of all, like you sort of did there, caution readers that you know, this is a work of history. And so the use of the terms, for example, white supremacy and terrorism are not anachronisms. You know, you're not trying to impose modern day contemporary words or phrases upon the past and distort the past to serve some sort of polemic or propagandistic motives now you're talking about the past and the terms white supremacy and terrorism were used then. So I'm interested in that decision to, to make that point because you and I both know that not all people who write history make that distinction. Eighteen sixties and 70s and for a long time, long, long time afterward, white supremacists were proud of terming themselves white supremacists. Uh, it was common language. It, it wasn't it wasn't a critique from from the other side. It was simply the way they thought about things, the way they thought about things, the way they wanted to be perceived. And indeed, sadly, they, they regarded that term as, as one of pride pride, racial pride, not something to be embarrassed about. Uh, and uh, the word terrorism, I mean, I, I, I've been asked, gee, did people really call it terrorism then? Yes, they did. Uh, other words were used. Very commonly, the word outrage was used for terror. Uh, uh, I mean, outrage today is a, a word without a lot of potency at all. But it 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 uh, it, it uh, had an electric uh, 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 kind of cargo, uh, just as terror terrorism do today. Uh, but nonetheless, terror and terrorism were you were used. They were acknowledged. That you you run into it in in um, letters letters that terrorized. African Americans and white Republicans wrote to President Ulysses Grant, which actually his letters were one of the most useful sources that I have for this book. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people wrote from the South in those years when Grant was president, begging for help, begging for protection, begging for federal troops, uh, describing in 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 uh, sadly sometimes pretty gruesome detail. Uh, uh, what had happened to themselves, their families, their children, their parents, uh, by night riders, by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, 
the letters are first person testimony. There are hundreds of them. There are other sources than that. Uh, and uh, there is nothing, you, you can't read these uh, without seeing terror. The terror, it's in, it's in people's, it, it, it just seethes from people, people's uh, uh, insides, how frightened they are and how extraordinarily brave people were uh, to endure terror uh, in the name often of their beliefs. That's to say both African-Americans and white Republicans who for years uh, fought to build a two-party system, a fragile two-party system in the South, uh, and they died for it. Uh, at least, at a minimum, about 2,000 people were killed, uh, murdered by, by uh, the Klan between uh, the late 1860s and the early 1870s. That's a minimum. That figure is from the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, there were undoubtedly more, probably quite a few more. So the numbers are not small, and that's murdered. It doesn't include the tens of thousands, tens of thousands who were uh, uh, beaten, shot, wounded, lynched, raped, um, uh, terrorized in other uh, in other ways, and and all those who were uh, uh, attacked and victimized beyond even the reach of newspapers or court testimony out there in the hamlets of, of, of the Deep South, whose, whose stories aren't even known and can't be known, except perhaps uh, locally, and probably not even then, because the whites who are writing history didn't want to remember that. It really... Uh... There's a sense in U.S. history and kind of a mainstream, particularly in textbooks, um, that, and as a former teacher, I can certainly say this, that there's a kind of triumphalist, progressive, uh, you know, movement toward getting better, some setbacks, but getting better and better. And I think your book and Foner's book and Du Bois' book are really important in challenging that, uh, speaking back to to that uh, misunderstanding of U.S. history. But also something else that you do, it to me, as a reader and as a historian, is recast Ulysses S. Grant. Because I think the more traditional or more mainstream approach to Grant has been war hero, who was inept by the second administration, failed by bad decision making, bad investments, you know, credit mobilier. Uh, I probably said that wrong, mobilier. I don't know. You may have to correct me there, Fergus. And whiskey ring, you know, all of these scandals that rocked the administration, his second administration in particular. But you see a grant who came out of the Civil War, is incredibly successful, politically astute, growing, careful to avoid the Tenure in Office Act Johnson trial to impeach him, right, and make his way into the White House. He was an unlikely advocate for uh, freedmen and freedwomen's rights, for, uh, for I would say, but he grew, he changed. How did you come to see, how did you enter Grant at the beginning of your work, your research, and how did you leave Grant once you were polishing the, the book? I found Grant quite fascinating uh, because he evolved a great deal. He, and you, you you can see him evolve. Grant, fortunately, also was an extremely good writer. Uh, uh, he was very well educated, contrary to what some people might imagine. West Point was one of the best schools in the United States uh, in the 19th century. People got a very good education there. Uh, and it was an education primarily in engineering and in, in the, the, art, the military arts. But but also uh, a, a, to a significant degree, also a kind of classical humanities education. 
uh, I mean, it, look, it was it wasn't it wasn't Yale, but but uh, but the quality of education was on a par. I, I I don't mean to say it was a second rate at all to Yale, just it was a bit different. However, so Grant Grant was very expressive. His memoirs, anybody who's read the memoirs, part of them knows the man could tell a story. He could express himself very well, and he was he was a very sensitive man. He was an extremely sensitive individual and unusually so for a, a, a man who made his life in the military. Um, uh, so anyway, a, a, a little capsule bio of Grant here for, for people who may not be too clear about it. Um, he was raised in Ohio. He was born in a very small cottage. You can visit the house. It exists today in Southern Ohio on the Ohio River. Uh, Initially, a pretty, pretty modest childhood. Uh, his father was an abolitionist. Um, they came originally from Connecticut. Um, uh, not Grant personally, it's raised in Ohio, but the, the family came from Connecticut. Um, Grant himself was not an abolitionist. He was not a political man as a young person. Um, but certainly he leaned in the direction of uh, kind of a Whig outlook on government rather than a certainly not a Southern states rights way of looking at, at, at things. Um, as most people now know, he, he owned in his lifetime, one enslaved person briefly, very briefly when he was married, uh, that man uh, was a gift. Think about it, a gift from, uh, from his in-laws uh, when he married in, in Missouri, the in-laws were slave owners. By the way, Grant's farm uh, and, and that property can be visited too. It's on the outskirts of St. Louis. It's an extremely interesting spot. And these questions are, are addressed by the National Park Service site there, to their credit. Uh, Grant uh, uh, wasn't, wasn't financially flush. He needed the man's work. But as soon as he could uh, afford to free the man he did, he could have sold that man, had he wished to, in Missouri, for probably $1,000 to $1,500, quite a bit of money in, in 1860. He didn't. He freed him because Grant, slavery made Grant very uncomfortable. As I said, he wasn't a political abolitionist, uh, but he evolved into an abolitionist. I mean, when he had to, to make a personal choice, he emancipated uh, a person. During the war, uh, he recognized right from the beginning, I mean, there are letters to his father in this vein, he recognized the war was going to destroy slavery uh, and that that was a good thing. Morally, he wanted to see it destroyed. In the course of the war, one, he welcomed a fugitive slaves into his, his, uh, his army's camps, not all, not all federal officers did. Many of them, especially at the beginning, returned uh, 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 freedom seekers to their owners. Uh, Grant didn't. He found jobs for them uh, in his camps. Second, uh, he also supported the recruitment of black troops, of black volunteers during the war. There were other generals, including his close friend, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, who wanted no black troops whatsoever. He refused, to, he refused to, to have them in his armies. Sherman, that is, Grant welcomed them. And during the later last year or so of the war, in the East, when Grant came East, a very significant proportion of his troops were black. They were the troops actually who liberated Richmond in, in, in 1865. The first troops to march in were black. <laughs> um, quite a scene, quite a scene, yeah. actually, in, in and of itself. Uh, so Grant was transformed on the issue of race. I mean, he it mattered to him. And the more interaction he had with Black Americans, the more he uh, grasped what the experience of slavery was to individuals, to men and women. And it mattered to him. Uh, uh, after the war, he was radicalized. And he, he was not a natural radical. In fact, wasn't even a natural politician, which was part of his problem. Uh, he, he wasn't a Bill Clinton, so to speak, who... Uh, 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 
he 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 was uh, rather shy actually uh but at any last word here i i, I can see i'm you have something to ask me but uh, uh he he realized that if the, the, that the end of slavery and the empowerment of black americans was one of the key fruits of the union victory in the war and he was committed to ensuring that victory to protecting it just just as he refused to countenance moving the capital of the United States further west, as many wanted to do after the war. Uh, uh, he he uh, was absolutely committed to protecting uh, the rights of, of, of African Americans, the three post-war amendments. He put his personal uh, prestige and credibility on the line uh, in the course to support legislation that would protect Black Americans, most particularly with the passage of the Ku Klux Klan Act, an enf- called an Enforcement Act, which enabled him uh, to lead the crackdown on the Klan in 1871, primarily. So a man who evolved. Well, I think that's one of the standout features of your book is showing the evolution of Grant because it would really be very easy to just have a static president and sometimes mm-hmm. that that's um, uh, just kind of a fill-in for uh, really suggesting that the the federal government's incompetent or unresponsive and in fact Grant was not. Grant was the opposite yeah. of that. But he had um, to... Pat, I'm sorry, go ahead. I say a word, Pat. Since... Yeah, I mean, as you as you said in the your your lead into this sec, this conversation about Grant, I mean, the the rap on Grant was oh his his administration was just a, a sump of corruption and incompetence and so on. Uh, was there some corruption? Yes, there was. Was Grant corrupt? No, he wasn't. People close, some people close to him were on the take. No question about it. Um, uh, very little of that actually had to do with Grant's mismanagement of the government. Grant was not a bad president. Uh, But the picture that most people may have of Grant, or at least until recently, uh, of his incompetence and and, 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 uh, uh, corruption, uh, really part of a systematic uh, lost cause era smear of Grant to denigrate who he was and what he was that was part and parcel of the uh, decades long Jim Crow, long Jim Crow era uh, commitment to denying the the significance of what was really going on during Reconstruction and the politically courageous efforts, as I said earlier, to to uh, uh, enforce civil rights. So that 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 vision of the incompetent Grant should really really go out the window. I'm so glad you uh, followed up with uh, with that uh, set of comments. Now, I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading from your book, and I, I know you're going to ultimately read two parts, but uh, maybe if you could please read the uh, part about Wyatt Outlaw and how we sure. come to meet this very important person who is really emblematic of of the struggle, the day-to-day terrorizing, uh, the day-to-day brutality leveled against Black Americans who are willing to stand up, and this is in North Carolina, uh, to stand up and speak out and become engaged in politics and become public figures. So if you wouldn't mind, please, Fergus, and you can, if you want to say something before you start reading, that's fine too. Sure. Um, this happens to be what opens the book. This is the first thing that you get in the book. And I, I want to say that the um, this is about, as you said, a man named Wyatt Outlaw. Outlaw was his actual family name. That's a common name, or was anyway, in that part of North Carolina. It's not an epithet. Uh, it was just his plain old name, like Smith or Jones. Um, and otherwise, I think this... Uh, I think this section pretty much speaks for itself. Graham, North Carolina. About 11 p.m. on February 26, 1870, 
The nighttime silence was broken by wild hallooing and the pounding of horses moving fast through the drizzly mist. Their riders wore white gowns and masks, and they surrounded the small frame house where Wyatt Outlaw lived with his small children and elderly mother. Twenty men burst into the house. They had great torches lighted, Jemima, Wyatt's mother later told state officials. First, they came and threw the covers all off of me. Then they said to me, where's Wyatt? One says, say, say, say. There were two who had swords and there were pistols. One said, cut her head off. And another said, blow her brains out. They went out of that room and as they passed, one says to the other, let us set the house afire. And as they went around to the room and I heard the little child cry, that's the baby, oh daddy, oh daddy. I ran and opened the door and they were all around him, all around my son. He was putting on his pants and I run back and got a stick and laid away as hard as I could. They jumped on me, they did, three of them, and stamped me. And I rose three times and they knocked me down. After they stamped, they said, God damn you, you strike a white man? And they stamped me three times in my breast and on my head and my arms. And then I hollered for murder and they went off with him. They hollered like geese, and they went hard as thunder, riding. Wyatt Outlaw was about 50 years old that night, a light-skinned man of mixed race, a mulatto in the parlance of the time, with black wavy hair and beard, an earnest manner, and a notably bold, self-confident gaze. He had escaped slavery in 1864, made his way to Union lines, and enlisted in the cavalry and served with it through the end of the Civil War and for a while after. When he came home, he opened a woodworking shop where he repaired wagons and made coffins and managed a sort of informal tavern where white and black workingmen gathered. He was counted among Graham's small black middle class and quickly gained a reputation among freed people as a man who knew things, who could speak with confidence, who could persuade a natural leader in 1866, he had represented Alamance County at a statewide Freedmen's Convention. He was the local leader of the Union League, the organizing arm of the Republican Party, a founder of Graham's first AME church, an elected town commissioner, and helped form an armed patrol of blacks and whites to protect against the rising threat of Ku Klux Klan violence. When others called for retaliation, he counseled restraint, urging Blacks to be as industrious as possible, give no cause for complaint, and trust in the law. Outlaw's captors dragged, pushed, and beat him, half-dressed and barefoot, a half-mile down Main Street, to the courthouse at the center of town. They strung him up with a bed cord from the branch of an elm tree that reached toward the Italianate courthouse from which, for the past year, the Republicans had governed Graham. If Outlaw had any, any final words, no one recorded them. One of the clansmen slashed his mouth with a knife, a last bit of pointed savagery toward a man who had too often spoken out for the rights that black men had been told by the national government and by North Carolina's embattled Republican governor were now theirs. His body dangled in front of the courthouse until the middle of the next day, when it was finally cut down by the sheriff a former member of the Klan. The coroner ruled that Outlaw had died at the hands of persons unknown. Not long afterward, a black man named Perrier claimed to know who the murderers were. A few days later, he was found floating dead in a pond. In the months that followed, without Outlaw's leadership, the Union League fell apart and frightened Republicans fled town. Wyatt Outlaw was but one victim, a grimly typical one, of a movement that was sweeping the former Confederacy. Its targets were freed people and their white allies, who by their words or actions, however tacit, sought to transform the South from a region where power had been organized to protect the economic engine of slavery, and now the debasement of former slaves, into a democracy where black and white, rich and poor, had a place in the dynamic arena of politics. With the Confederacy's defeat in 1865, there was reason for hope. 
the South seemed poised for a racial revolution that would transform former slaves into free actors in national life and overthrow the white oligarchies that had ruled the slave states since the founding of the Republic. And it goes on. I like your cat. Thank you. This is Bobka. Bobka loves history. So we have to we have to give credit where credit is due. You know, that I was just thinking of how your writing and your use of the <clears throat> eyewitness testimony of White Outlaw's mother it just reminds me so much of the book True Grit. Right. There's a voice. There's a way that you are able to ev evoke these people's stories of the past, of their pain, their pathos, but also their their their. In this is uh, unjust. It's 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 unacceptable that these things have happened, and they're going to speak about it. They're going to scream it to the hilltops. Of what happened to them, and they speak with candor and power, and and I really think that that passage is really emblematic of what you do throughout. Thank the you. Book. Yeah, I, it was very important to me, and I've done this actually in most of my books, to to capture as much as I can the voices of people of the time. Um, uh, it's hard work actually, since uh, uh, as we, as with any uh. uh we all, we all, we all tend to talk too much and say too little, if you know what I mean. Uh, or I do. <laughs> I'm speaking uh, in in ordinary conversation and so on. Think of think of the stuff we put into emails that you know is not worth not worth really remembering. But uh, to 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 uh, capture the, the 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 urgency of what people have to say. The, the you know the essential truths and of of their experience, um, and it was all the more important in this particular book because the people obviously who who uh, were the primary targets of Klan violence were African Americans, uh, and whose stories uh, throughout American history have been too little told, too little remembered, too little recorded, and. Uh, one of the other main sources I used here, which is a, an extraordinarily important source for material from the period, is the um, uh, report of the Joint Committee on the Ku Klux Klan, Congressional Committee, 18, which, which in 1871 sent subcommittees traveling through the former Confederate states, uh, interviewing people who were both victims of the Klan and also others who observed what the Klan was doing. And they collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimony in, in real time, in real time. And that, that is recorded. By the way, that report, I'll, I'll warn you, it's 13 volumes and it's about 6,000 pages of, of copy. From so all... That's what the historian's for. <laughs> well, that's that, I've saved you the trouble. But, but, but... Um, it's very intense. This this report. Uh, it, it's uh, these are hearings. So you're hearing people's real voices. This is not a synopsis of what people said, but it's their actual testimony. And um, uh, you're hearing people who've never had people listen to them before. People often explain that they've walked five, 10, 50, 40 miles in one case to speak to the congressman and to describe what happened to themselves, to their families, their children, in their communities, to tell about the people who were killed. Uh, to uh, I, I, There were people who will say, I don't know if I'm going to make it home alive just because I came here to talk to you. And there's at least one, I mean, I, there, perhaps there are others, instance of, of a man who was in fact murdered on the way home because he testified, uh, an African-American farmer. So you're hearing people we're not recorded anywhere else talking about a, a profound period of crisis in their lives and in, in the lives of the, 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 the America that they live in here. Uh, so it's both personal and, and, and societal. Uh, so you know, I, I wanted their, their words in here rather than me just telling you what people said. Uh, well, that's the power of your book. 
clan war is that it, it it's not a top down and so that's why i want to highlight that even though we're really looking at uh 13th amendment 14th amendment 15th amendment re congressional and supreme court reactions ruling slaughterhouse cases to try to kind of outline uh comment upon reign in subdue parts of these uh, not the 13th amendment so much but certainly the 14th and 15th uh, we're, we're looking at also the groundswell of people looking to be able to vote, to be able to hold political office, Black Americans, uh, members of the Republican Party, white Republicans, white abolitionists, people who wanted to have a, a say so and participate in reconstruction, in the reconstituting of the country in a, in a fair or more just way. And one of the things that was also really interesting to me is the ongoing debate about the presence of federal troops ah. in the South. So I'd be interested, if you could, for us to, to comment on that, because there was a lot of criticism that, OK, well, the war is over. Why are there troops? Why are we still are, are we occupied? Why is this constitutional? Uh, why are there federal troops here? And the answer was uh, the the or first organized terrorist movement in United States history is maiming, murdering, uh, castrating, raping, intimidating people throughout the South, and we have to do something about it. We have to protect them. So what about the presence of the military, even as it dwindled over time? One, they're, they're a, a staple of, of um, reactionary uh, Democratic Party rhetoric of the post-Civil War era. For those who may not know this but i the democratic party was the conservative to reactionary party of the day and the republican party was the more progressive party so you've got to mentally uh flip flip that a bit so at any rate a staple of their rhetoric was that the south was under military occupation and that's often been kind of uh taken as a given by people who haven't really thought too much about it okay was the south under military occupation in 1865, the war ends uh, in July of that year, there were a million federal troops in the former Confederate states. By 1868, three years later, there were 12,000. 12,000 spread over 11 states. There were only uh, about uh, 140 in North Carolina, 140. There were 65 or so in Mississippi. This is not military occupation. You know? uh, to even imagine that that's what it is, is to surrender to lost cause propaganda. Okay, so there was nowhere near enough troops. There should have been many more troops. Uh, the public didn't want to pay for them. People, people, people just didn't want to pay taxes uh, to support more troops in the South. And the soldiers wanted to go home. After four years of war, they wanted to go, they wanted to go home. Uh, so uh, the federal government, and particularly under Grant, was under a lot of pressure to keep reducing the number. So uh, there were far too few to really protect all the people who needed to be protected. Uh, and this is, a, this is a really significant fact. And most of the federal troops in the South were infantry. And uh, I think and anyone can realize it's kind of hard for, for infantrymen to catch cavalrymen. The Klansmen were all mounted, were all mounted. The federal troops were on foot, uh, which is just one of several reasons that the Klan was able to wage its war of terror as effectively as it did, they, 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 which they did with relative impunity. Okay, so what's the other part of my answer to your question? Well, in 1871, thanks to the passage of the Third Enforcement Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act, Ulysses Grant, the president, uh, was empowered to crack down on the Klan explicitly. Uh, uh, he was given, these were temporary powers, by the way, significant to remember, uh, to suspend habeas corpus where necessary, um, to dispatch federal prosecutors 
uh, more federal prosecutors into the South to prosecute the Klan. Local prosecutors, by and large, wouldn't do it because they were either afraid or they'd been co-opted by the Klan. Uh, and third, to dispatch troops, more troops. And his main target is upcountry South Carolina, although there were also troops dispatched to North Carolina as well. South Carolina, the, 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 the upstate South Carolina, was a, an epicenter of Klan activity. In certain counties, 50, 60, 70 percent of the white male population had joined the Klan. Imagine. Just about everybody was in it. Uh, and those who weren't were intimidated by it. At any rate, uh, Grant sent about a thousand troops into uh, upcountry South Carolina. The troops he sent, it's quite interesting. The core of that group was the 7th Cavalry. Uh, yes, that is the same unit uh, that, that was uh, partially wiped out at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. So some of the same soldiers sent to sent to fight the Klan in South Carolina died in, under Custer. Was Custer there? No, he wasn't. Custer was a reactionary Democrat. He didn't want any part of Reconstruction if he could avoid it. And he spent most of this period racing horses in Kentucky, um, which he cared more about than, than the rights of Black people. But the officer, Grant, uh, who ultimately was in charge of this operation, I'm going to mention his name. He's not well known, but he should be, was, was a Major Lewis Merrill. Uh, really, really an impressive guy who was an abolitionist, unusual in the pre-war army. He, had a, he, he fought a, against Confederate guerrillas during the war. So he was perfectly skilled in, in addressing what was, in fact, a guerrilla war right. on the part of the Ku Klux Klan. Third, he was a lawyer. He knew the law. Uh, he, and fourth, happily, he was a very good writer. So his reports are terrific. They're in the National Archives in Washington here. Uh, so his accounts to his his uh, uh, to the Adjutant General's office in in Washington D.C. are terrific. They're they're copious. They're beautifully written. They're detailed. They're vivid. And he had an unusual insight into psychology for somebody of that era. And as he tried to understand the mentality one of people who would join the Klan in the first place, two of those who would be cowed by the Klan, frightened of the Klan, and he was extremely effective at breaking the Klan. And I, I, I will resist the temptation to just talk about him for the next hour because everybody's going to go away and not hear it. Uh, but suffice it to say that uh, uh, he arrested in upcountry South Carolina more than 5,000 Klan members. The Klan collapsed. Uh, why did it collapse? One, because he was able to penetrate it with spies very, very effectively. He knew who belonged, he knew what they were doing and what they were guilty of. Um, and he 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 began by breaking lower ranking members and then working his way all the way up to the top. Uh, so virtually the entire clan uh, in, over the period of about a year surrendered. Um, uh, two, uh, the Klan was very brave when they were when when in in large numbers of ten or twenty or fifty they were terrorizing lone individuals who were unarmed like uh, Wyatt Outlaw and his mother and his child uh, isolated in their homes and cabins. They were very brave then, but faced with the with with the soldiers of the Seventh Cavalry armed with carbines and ready to shoot, they just collapsed. They were cowards. Of course, they were hiding in their disguises. They were hiding in their disguises and, and their behavior was completely cowardly, both in the way they committed crimes uh, and in, in, in the way that they just caved when faced with real soldiers. Um, so uh, I'm going to resist, as I said, elaborating further on that. I, I, I bet there are some people in the audience who would like to ask questions. If you have a question, for Fergus, please feel free to post it in the chat. You can log in to YouTube and post it in the YouTube chat, or you can send us an email with your question to virtualqa at malaprops.com, virtualqa at malaprops.com. So here's a question, Fergus. 
Uh, I cannot wait to read your book. Well, there's a declaration first. Declaration first. Can you please compare and contrast Grant's commitment to civil rights for freed slaves with his administration's treatment of Native Americans? This is the time of Grant's peace policy, right? Yeah. um, That's a very good question, okay? Okay. Grant, okay, Indian policy in the United States uh, has varied a great deal through American history. Nearly all of it has been bad until until recent times. Uh, we, I'm not, we're not going to talk about the present day, late 20th century. It, it's, uh, we again, we'd be here for the next month. Okay, especially with with you, Pat. Right, with the two of us here, I don't we'd think we we have to okay. you know do a uh, month I mean, long. But within the context of his time, and I'm an historian, you know, I mean, I'm not my book. This my book about the Klan, nor is my book about Indian about guilt mongering. You know, I I mean, I think that is a dead end. You know, just 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 uh, haranguing our ancestors for not being perfect people and. What I what I what I believe in and what I try to do in the books I write is just to be clear and truthful. Just to determine what happened. Let's see what actually happened, as opposed to what do we imagine happened or what do we wish had happened or and so on. So within the context context of its time, Grant's peace policy was an enlightened policy. Uh, he had a desire uh, to reform Indian policy. Uh, which had been notoriously corrupt and said to say continued to be pretty corrupt uh, over time. Uh, he encouraged uh, the handing over of um, reser- reservation uh, agents to to Quakers, who on the whole had an extremely good uh, 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 record uh, in 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 relating to, uh, to Native Americans. Okay, I mean, we could split a lot of hairs there, but anyway, that's uh, by and large true. Grant had a desire to establish a more humane policy uh, toward Native Americans. Uh, uh, the frontier was a chaotic place. The United States government throughout its history was never able to control the frontier. Uh, uh, policymakers sometimes were just hard shell racists who thought of Indians as something other other than 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 human beings. Uh, but there were also plenty of policymakers scattered here and there in American history who very much regarded Native Americans as human beings, uh, but how to fit tribes into the United States within the value system of the 19th century or 18th was always a challenge, was always a challenge. Grant certainly was committed to a reservation policy towards a pacification policy, to an ending of wars with with the tribes. Uh, What happened in in 1876? I'm going to answer my own question, of course. Uh, 1876, in the middle of uh, Grant's, uh, uh, or near the end of Grant's second term, uh, George Custer and his, uh, 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 much of the 7th Cavalry were killed in an extremely misguided battle. In Montana. Uh, it completely exploded what was left of Grant's peace policy. And there was no way at that point that Grant could avoid presiding over, although he was, would soon be out of the presidency, presiding over a war policy, renewed war in the West. Uh, it's not what he wanted. It's not what he sought. But he was a soldier. And, and, and there was no way, I think, of avoiding war after uh, June of 1876. Um, so it's a mixed record. It's a very mixed record. You know, he was not operating by the values of the late 20th, early 21st century, but within the context of the time, it was not unenlightened. As we're uh, at the top of the hour, if you wouldn't mind, uh, an audience, I understand if you, you, you can watch this uh, and the rerun on Malaprop's YouTube channel so don't worry if you have to go you're still going to be able to hear it but if fergus if you wouldn't mind 
uh, talking just a, a little bit about what you're g- working on next, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Well, we've arrived at the year 1876 in our conversation. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm well underway with another book. Uh, uh, it's uh, tentatively titled Centennial. That may change, but it may not. I don't, I'm not sure. And it's really about the conjunction of crises that the United States faced in its centennial year of 1876. And this started out as a rather, as many books do, as a rather small idea, uh, just writing about the uh, great centennial exhibition of 1876, uh, the Western Hemispheres, America's first World's Fair in Philadelphia, a celebration of the country's first hundred years, but also a, a stock taking of what that first century meant. What had the United States become in the course of a century compared, what did the founders uh, uh, foresee and what had actually happened? But it just kept metastasizing outward from that. And uh, what was happening in 1876, short, short version here, <clears throat> when I say, conjunction of crises, you have finally the effective end of Reconstruction, which I talk about in the Klan War, but we'll talk about from a different angle in, in the next book. Uh, you have the, uh, the the crisis in the West, which we just talked about, uh, centered around the uh, destruction of Custer's command, which which right in the middle of the, of the, of the centennial celebrate, I mean, what didn't happen in Philadelphia, but it, but it, in, in the middle of that period, uh, you have a, a, a dramatic spike in labor management conflict, which will lead to the country's first great general strike in 1877. Um, so labor management, Western settlement, Indian warfare, uh, the end of Reconstruction, the whole, and th- that relates to the whole question of race in America at that time. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the several leading characters in this book um, uh, is the is a person again whom everybody should know about, but hardly anybody does at the moment. A, a woman named Edmonia Lewis, uh, Edmonia Lewis, who was the first African American sculptor, uh, and was a great success. Her she she exhibited at the Centennial Exhibition, and her sculpture won awards. It was. It was regarded as the most interesting. I, I won't get into this in any more detail. Uh, everybody went to see it. And she lived a bohemian life as an artist. Quite unusual. Very unusual. Uh, shunned marriage. Uh, dressed very flamboyantly. Uh, uh, lived in Rome to do her, did her work in Rome, but actually sold all her work in the United States, traveled around independently, a very interesting woman. But she's aware, here is an, here is a, an African-American woman of her time who sees the future, both sees and is seizing the opportunities that the Reconstruction era has, has created. But at the same moment, when Reconstruction is collapsing in the South, so I'm playing with questions like that's just one example. Uh, and finally, the final element is really the transformation of the Republican Party from a progressive, idealistic party fun- focused in large part on extending uh, uh, and ensuring human rights, civil rights, into the party of money, money and power, which is happening at the same time. So. Well, that I can't wait to read it. I'm already just, just looking forward to it. And one of the things that you know, as we're wrapping up, I want to say about Klan War is that you really do highlight that the government, the federal government was effective in cracking down on the Klan, that this was, you know, 1871, 1872, this, the grant strategy for breaking the Klan uh, and their their terrorist movement, it was effective. And so the, fe- the, the idea that Reconstruction was a failure, that whole lost cause, that kind of birth of a nation, all of that, uh, is really not what happened. In fact, it was possible for the federal government to have an effective policy that, that broke 
the clan. And it was the gradual dwindling, as you've said, of Northern voting support to continue to fund uh, this uh, breaking of the Klan and, and support, support Black civil rights uh, that, that was key to the, the, the failure, if you say, or the dwindling of the, the power behind Reconstruction. So when you're when you're looking at the end of the book, and I had asked you to, if you wouldn't mind, read uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, who had really a, I mean, maybe scalding is too harsh a word, but he did have uh, some straightforward words for what what is this art, uh, this science. Of history, what are we doing? And I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading that as we're winding up here. Sure, that's that's what I'm reading. I think the last page of the book, as it happens, you've got the first page and you're getting the last page. Right. Um, so Du Bois wrote in 1935 this in Black Reconstruction, which we talked about earlier. He wrote the following. One is astonished in the study of history at the recurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, distorted, or skimmed over. The difficulty, of course, with this philosophy is that history loses its value as an incentive, an example. It paints perfect men and noble nations, but it does not tell the truth. If we're going to use history for our pleasure and amusement, for inflating our national ego and giving us a false but pleasurable sense of accomplishment, then we must give up the idea of history, either as a science or as an art. And uh, there are several states in the United States which seem to be instituting precisely what uh, 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 Du Bois was describing 90 years ago as, as we speak. Well, Fergus Bordovic, I want to thank you so much for writing Clan War, uh, for the work that you do and the work that you've done and the work you're going to do, because we're all better for it. Uh, we're challenged by it, and that's part of what you bring uh, to your rigorous study of history and your beautiful prose. Thank you so much for talking about Clan War uh, with Malaprops, and uh, I hope you'll come back when you finish your next book. I would sure love to, and thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Stephanie, for hosting this as well. Good night, everyone. We really appreciate your joining us this evening. Good night, everyone.